Good evening. I'm Janet Jacobson. I'm director of the Center for Research on Women here at Barnard College. And I'd like to welcome you tonight to our event with Sister Helen Prejean. I especially want to thank you all for coming out this evening. This is an important moment for us to come together as a community. Before I begin the introduction, I just have a couple of announcements. There are a number of organizations, including um, our co-sponsors tonight, the Campaign to End the Death Penalty and the Moratorium Campaign, of which Sister Helen is the honorary chairman. And you're going to be able to, as you go out, stop by their tables on the way out, pick up their literature. There are a lot of events that are happening around the city in upcoming days and weeks. And you'll also be able to sign petitions for the moratorium campaign. And I believe also sign up as members as well. Then all the way in the back, you'll be able to purchase copies of Dead Man Walking. Sister Helen has graciously agreed to sign the copies. You're going to want to go back out and then come back up here. The signing table will be right in front of the stage. Um, the purchase of the books, the funds will go to the moratorium campaign or to Blue Stockings Women's Bookstore here in New York City. There are also some special editions that were signed by Sister Helen and Susan Sarandon. Um, unfortunately, Susan Sarandon could not be with us tonight, and she sends her regrets. This event is the opening event for the Center's Fall Lecture Series, and it is also this semester's contribution to Women Seeking Justice, which is a series that focuses on the conditions of imprisonment and of women's imprisonment in particular. We offer this series in conjunction with Barnard's support of the education program at Bedford Hills Women's Correctional Facility in New York State. We are very thankful that Sister Helen is here to speak with us tonight about her current participation in the moratorium campaign, which is an effort to bring about a worldwide moratorium on the death penalty. We were extraordinarily pleased several months ago when we found out that Sister Helen would be able to work us into her busy schedule. But we feel more, more than fortunate that she is able to be with us tonight, so directly after the terrible violence and tragedy that has befallen the city of New York, Washington, D.C., and our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones. I want to say a special thanks to Sister Helen and also to the staff of the Center for Research on Women who worked so hard to get her here and also to get out the word that she was going to be here. To our student workers, to David Hobson, our intrepid manager, who is here despite his illness, and especially to Liz Budnitz, our administrative assistant, who did most of the work in bringing Sister H Helen here, including the work of literally going to pick her up in New Jersey this morning. We made the invitation to Sister Helen long ago in what now seems like a different world when we inaugurated the Women Seeking Justice series. We found it hard to think of anyone whose work, whose life, and whose commitments could better define the concept of a woman seeking justice. She is well known to most of you, I'm sure, through her book, Dead Men Walking, and the subsequent film starring Susan Sarandon and Sean Penn. And hers remains an incredibly important voice on this issue, not just in the United States, but in the world. The work of Sister Helen and stalwart advocates like her, many of whom I know are here in the audience tonight, has kept the issue of the death penalty alive over the last decade. And it seems as if this issue is returning to the central consciousness of American public life. There is now talk about a moratorium on the death penalty, not just among those of the moratorium campaign and associated efforts, but among mainstream political leaders, including even the governor of Illinois. But all too often, this public conversation has focused on the injustice of the application of the death penalty, and all too rarely on the question of the justice of the death penalty itself. With regard to the injustice of the application of the death penalty, some political leaders are finally willing to admit what the statistics have shown for so long, that the death penalty is applied differentially according to race, region, and access to money for our defense. The United States, unfortunately, looks no better in terms of worldwide statistics. ABC News reported in June of 2001 that four nations now account for 90% of executions. 
China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. But Sister Helen asked something more of us than just the recognition of these all-important facts. She asked us to consider the justice, and yes, the ethics, of responding to violent crime with executions. It is to help us consider the moral integrity of how our society responds to social pain that we have invited her here to speak with us, and we can think of no better moment to have this conversation. We felt that she could lead us in such a conversation because she has proven herself to be a person of moral and also spiritual integrity. We thought it was very important to hear from a woman who is herself a religious leader and who offers us a religious and specifically a Catholic voice, one that is not necessarily what we always hear highlighted in the mainstream media. Sister Helen has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize four different times, and thus she is truly a world religious leader. We also invited her because Sister Helen takes seriously that the victims of violent crime are suffering and that we should reach out to them. She recognizes that those who have suffered violence also suffer pain, pain that is not theirs alone, pain that is socially important and meaningful. Sister Helen has founded a support group for murder victims family, and she is an honorary member of Murder Victims for Reconciliation. I don't think that anyone who has seen the images over the last several days of our friends and neighbors downtown who are looking for their loved ones would be able to deny the reality of their pain. I don't think that anyone could deny the enormity of the loss of so many lives in the past few days. Not just lives, but people. People who were so obviously and so deeply loved. Sister's Hel Sister Helen's measure message is one that asks us to attend to this pain. We should not dismiss it and we should not minimize it in any way. But her moral stance also asks us to consider, to question our own responses to that pain. She has asked us, is the death penalty the best way to respond to the grief and anger that victims of violent crime justifiably feel? When we think of the enormity of our most recent losses and its attendant grief and anger, we must ask, what is the best way to express care and concern for the victims and those who love them in so many different ways? What is the best way to express a sense of injustice that simply going to work should prove so dangerous for so many? What is the best way to say that this should never happen again? And what is the best way to act so that, in fact, this never does happen again? What does it mean that some of our fellow Americans are reporting that they have been harassed on the street because of their perceived ethnicity or nationality? And will our actions as a nation lead to a decrease or to an increase in violence in the future? How is it best to remember and honor those who have been lost? How best can we seek justice in an unjust world? These are difficult questions, and we are more than fortunate to have Sister Helen here to help us think through them. Sister Helen Prejean. Thank you. It is good to be here. I was met at the door of this place by students handing out flyers saying, come to discuss with us, not to respond to hate with violence, but it's a time for healing and, and not to meet violence with violence. And the guy that drove the car from the New York Review of Books where I was coming uh, is obviously of, um, from the Middle East, and he said, uh, people are hating us. Um, you know, that he, his friend's little child got beat up at school simply because their skin is brown and, and people don't know who to lash out against, so they lash out against everybody. And here at Barnard, you met with the faces of students who are saying, you know, there's another way. And uh, so already, I'm impressed with this place. I, I like this place. I, I'm glad I can be here tonight with you. I'm a storyteller, and I'm going to take you into some realms of experience that I know you haven't had, but that's what stories can do. That's why they wrote Moby Dick. That's why they wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. 
Uncle Tom's Cabin was a book where when it was when it was out, everybody accepted that slavery, well, we needed it for economic interest or whatever. And they read Uncle Tom's Cabin and got inside. People were slaves and saw they felt and loved and like other human beings. We need books. We need stories. We need a way of being able to access experience. And that touches me about Barnard also, because you have different ethnic groups. It's truly multicultural. You're not just going around your little train around a Christmas tree on a little bitty track with folks just like you. What kind of education do you get from that? And so it's like opening us up into the world and to other people. And I'm coming to you from Genesis Farm, which is an hour and 15 minutes away from this place where Sister Miriam McGillis, because the Dominican sisters given 150 acres of land, what, Maria, 25 years ago, huh? And she started a bioregional community in organic and community farming where we can find a way to live with Earth in a way that it's mutually sustaining. We don't have to exploit Earth and hurt Earth in order to live. And wonderful things go on there in terms of learning about different cultures and the indigenous women, women's wisdom, science, what the new science is teaching us, and quantum physics, and the story of the universe, and how it came to be, as well as the classical Western wisdom that we've gotten uh, in Western culture. Wonderful stuff going on there. So I thought I was heading on my way to Buffalo, New York, and San Francisco. Only plans changed. Everybody's plans changed after Tuesday, and so I'm at Genesis Farm. So. Liz came to get me, and here I am, and I'll go back there tonight, but I want to tell all of you about this place, and the Women's Center can give you more information, and perhaps you can find your way over there. Plus, it's wonderful just to get out from the cement and get your feet into the green, and they got wonderful gardens, organic, and wonderful food, and good, good people. Okay, some stories. I want to take you with me into some realms of experience tonight. First, I just want to say a little bit about the, the making of the film Dead Man Walking, because, you know, not everybody is lining up to make a film like Dead Man Walking. And when Tim Robbins had worked on the script and was shopping it around, every major Hollywood studio in the United States turned down that script. They said, Tim, this is a downer. I mean, you got a nun going to talk to a death row inmate, and you know, they got no romantic element in it. You know, like, uh, if you let us spice it up, now maybe if the nun and the death row inmate could, you know. <laughs> they all turned it down. They said people aren't going to want to come see this film. And I remember coming to New York for the opening of the film. It opened in Los Angeles in New York on December the 29th, 1995. And I remember standing in line in the theater Dead Man Walk, and it was on all the telephone booths and stuff, you know, there. And we were standing in line, and I'm going, oh, God, we were up against Sense and Sensibility, and we were up against, I never thought of other movies as like our competition, you know what I mean? All the people standing in line, and I heard people behind me, and they talk, and they was kind of, well, which one are you going to see? And I heard the lady say, well, we're going to see Dead Man Walking. I'm going... And then we hear an announcement that the 8 o'clock film had been sold out, and I'm going. <laughs> and then it was the first time I was in the theater with people to experience the film, to see Tim's work, to see Susan's work of bringing people there. And the, the film's not a polemic against the death penalty, where it gives you the 482 reasons why you ought to be against it. But it takes you there over to both sides, into the tragedy, into the victims' lives, over to the one being executed, it's gradually revealed what he did and his responsibility. Then you meet his mama, and you meet his brothers, and you see them going through the experience of their loved one being executed. And then in the victim's family, you meet one victim's family who's totally for the death penalty, can't wait to see him die, tells the news media afterwards, all right, we got our justice tonight. And the other victim's family, where the father's trying to go, I don't know about seeing the guy, I mean, I think I gotta do this. And then you see him trying to make his way out from under that rock and that whole uh, paradigm of the only way to heal your pain is to watch another human being die. And we are very much in that paradigm right now. We hear our leaders saying only one line, one thing. This is the old story, this is to Mary McGillis over Genesis Farm, the old story. 
All we know is retaliation, military solution, meet violence with violence, which of course is what the death penalty is in microcosm. Somebody's done this terrible thing to a family, and when you lose one loved one, your whole universe is shattered. It doesn't have to be multiplied by 4,168 as in Oklahoma City. You lose your mother, you, you lose your brother, you lose your boyfriend in violence and the whole universe is shattered because every human being is like a universe and we can't be replaced, any of us, unique and irreplaceable. We're made that way by God, whatever name we call God. But a little bit getting back to the movie, how it got to be made. You see, I wasn't looking for a movie to be made precisely because of what I was telling you those Hollywood people were saying to Tim. I couldn't imagine what Hollywood was going to do with this story with me and Pat Sonier, the first guy I visit on death row. I knew they'd want to give it their little twist and have me eloping with the guy or whatever before the story was up. So I'm not looking for a film to be made a dead man walk. And one afternoon I'm in my kitchen, the phone rings, a voice in the other end says, Hi, I'm Susan Sarandon. I'm in Memphis. I'm filming the client. I'm reading your book. I'd love to meet you. And I said, great. I'd heard of Susan, of course. Many, mostly I'd heard about her through Amnesty International circles. That she was great for human rights. And so anyway, we decide on this restaurant. I run out, rent Thelma Louise, see what she looks like, <laughs> you know, before she comes into the restaurant. Well, guess what? Scene one, for some reason, I get her mixed up with Gina Davis. So the whole movie... I'm looking at Gina Davis, who's that ditzy one in Thelma and Louise, who does more and more stupid things, gets him in more and more trouble with the law. And I kept saying, I like Louise, I like Louise. So when Susan walks in the restaurant, I said, oh, thank you, God, she's Louise. I was so relieved. I was relieved more than anything. And we met. And Susan is a wonderful person. She's, she could be on this... Uh, college campus. She could be on the faculty. She could be a student here. She, strongly, she will never take a woman's role who just ends up as a little victim and goes, save me, save me, somebody, please help. She will never take those roles. She'll take the roles of women that make mistakes, but they change. And so S Susan and I have suffered. She said, I got to get the book to Tim Robbins. I'll go rent Bull Durham, see what he looks like. And that was a good one to rent, because they were both in that one. And, um, and Tim had another project going on, and, and, and she couldn't get him to read the book. And she'd periodically call me to give a little on-book report, <laughs> saying, I, can't, I know if I can get him to read the book, Helen, I know he'll want to do this, but he's in this other thing. And then finally, after six months, now it takes this, it takes the passion of one person who believes that something can happen because Tim wouldn't read it and he wouldn't read it and they are walking down, it was a corner of 6th Avenue and something and she took Tim by the arm and she burst into tears. She said, Tim, we have got to do that film and you've got to direct it. So, I mean, you see, you know, Susan doesn't cry easily. And so he took the book, he read it, then they called me up to New York and I remember sitting in their living room doing what a lot of people have done talk about, let's make a film. I knew nothing about filmmaking. I would learned about writing a book, but filmmaking, and so then the first thing Tim explains is we can't use all the two, you went to two people for the execution, and you met all those victims' families, we've got to do composite people, but we are going to distill the essential conflicts that are in this story. And you know that when William Faulkner got the Nobel Prize for Literature, he said in his address that he was allowed when he was given that, the only thing worth writing about is the conflict in the human heart. It's a secret of art, it's a secret of drama, it's a secret of good writing, it's a secret of storytelling. It's really the secret of life is that there's a conflict, there's something that's in opposition to something else. And we have to understand clearly both of those sides. And so when I did go to write Dead Men Walk, and I had this excellent editor, I just met with him this afternoon, his name's Jason Epstein, from Random House, and he showed me how I have to walk a thin line in the book, Dead Men Walking, to be on the side of the one about to be executed, and to see the violence the state was going to do to him, and on the side of the victims whose lives were shattered by that senseless act 
when their loved one was killed. And if I collapsed it in either direction, being overly sympathetic to the death row inmate, being overly, so overly sympathetic to the victims that all I could say was to call for what the victims were calling for, which was the death of the person, the book would collapse. He taught me that. He taught me that creative tension that you do. And you don't have to preach to people. You don't have to say, no, what you should really think about the death penalty is. What you do is you bring people over, and that's what Tim did in the film. He said, we're going to bring people over to both sides of this issue because most people, including, I'm sure, a lot of people in this room, including myself, have a deep ambivalence in us about people who do violent crimes against innocent other people. And we have to acknowledge that, that we feel outrage. We feel outrage and we feel fear. And we can up the ante on that to the, to the 1400th degree because of what we have just gone through in this country and you in this city. It was an act unpredicted, unbelievable, unimaginable that with our own domestic airlines an attack could be made on the people of the United States and so many people could be killed. But in one victim's family, if it's your child, if it's your mother, that's the universe, that's that whole universe in the same exact way but in a microcosm of, of one person's life. And we, so we feel the ambivalence because on the one hand we feel the outrage and on the other hand there's a part of us that knows we can't trust the government to get the potholes feel right. Much less to be turning over to them these decisions of who we can kill. Oh, we know that's true, and both of those things are in our souls at the same time, and we got to navigate them. We got to navigate our way through them morally to come to a stance, and what will it be? And Tim was very clear that the deepest moral question about the death penalty is not what to do about the innocent people. We know we shouldn't be executing innocent people, but what about when people are guilty, and we know they're guilty? and we prove they're guilty, and they've said they were guilty that they did it. Well, what about them? Can we kill them? That's where the deepest moral question of the death penalty comes. Before the film, of course, there was the book. And before the book, of course, there was this unfolding, incredible journey of a little Catholic nun in New Orleans who started out regular, a regular nun. How many of you were taught by nuns in, in, uh, in school? Okay, we got a few, few here, a few here, okay. I mean, the thing was though, the explosion for me and the illumination in terms of my own Christian religion had to do with understanding the gospel of Jesus. The way I was living it, and this happens, uh, I think, in religious circles, that it gets kind of privatized and individualized of an individual relationship with God. You learn how to pray. You learn how to meditate. You lead a good life. You never hurt anybody, and you're a good person. It, but among, in our community, the Sisters of St. Joseph, there was some fermentation going on in a debate in the community about what we ought to be doing as nuns in the 90s, in the 80s, what direction will we take? And it was this social justice stuff that kept popping up. I was directing people in retreats at that time. I wanted people to be holy, close to God. And they'd bring up all this social justice stuff. What are we going to do about economic justice? What are we going to do about racism? And I'd go, we can't settle all those problems. Those problems are too big for us. Let's everybody try to lead individually peaceful lives with one another. And, and we don't have to deal with any of that. How are we going to deal with any of that? And I was resisting it tooth and nail. And then we had a conference in Terre Haute. And a sister, a beautiful sister by the name of Marie Augusta Neal, who taught sociology and religion, came to talk to us at this conference right in the middle of nowhere in Terre Haute, Indiana, for three days. And I'd heard the rumor she was one of those social justice people before I went. So my guard was up. And I thought, i got to make it through three days of this woman giving us this stuff, three days. First day, I made it through unscathed because she gave us statistics about the condition of the world. The first world countries that consume so much of the world's resources, the poorer nations of the world, what justice meant, all of that. Walked out of there that, had a real nice supper, went to sleep, no problem. 
Second day she talked about Jesus. Well, I, I was thinking, well, excuse me. I think I know a little bit about Jesus myself. I have meditated on Jesus for over 35 years. I have meditated on the scriptures. And she talked about Jesus. And I'm going to tell you the line. It changed the axis, the spiritual axis of my life. And we never know when that's going to happen to us. We never know we're sitting in a class or we read a book or we meet a person where suddenly we get an illumination and it puts us on a trajectory that's different from where we have been before. We never know when that's going to happen to us. And it happened to me because there she was up here and we were all listening. I'm sitting in a chair just like you sitting in here tonight. And she says, Jesus preached good news to the poor. Well, I think, all right, I knew that. And I think I knew the next line, too, about how God was Abba or Daddy or compassionate God and you could talk to God and the secrecy of your heart. And, and then she said, and integral to the good news that Jesus preached to the poor was that they would be poor no longer. And I got it. First time, I got it. Of course, how are you going to go and preach to people? about how they're loved by God or anybody, and their, their kids don't have health care, and they live in neighborhoods where they're drive-by shootings and they're not safe, you know, where they're not treated with dignity and respect, and they go to a, a public school, and they're in 11th grade, and they can't read at a third grade level. They don't have education. They don't have health care. They don't have decent housing. They don't have a fair and living wage for their work. How can you preach anything to people about the love of anybody when they don't have justice? Of course it was integral. And I got it. I got it. And then I realized, I don't even know any poor people. That the first part of my pilgrimage and my journey was going to be to go meet people who were poor and struggling because I'd been out in the suburbs and not in touch with these people my whole life. I was kind of like the little girl. One time she was asked to write an essay, so she wrote an essay called The Poor Family. She said, once there was a very poor family. The mother and father were extremely poor. The children in the family were very desperately poor. The gardener was poor. The chauffeur was poor. The Everybody in the whole family was very, very poor. Because if we don't know real people, and we don't have real conversations with real people, we believe every stereotypical thing we hear. So I moved, and in Dead Man Walking, this is the first part of the journey. It's very much my story, what happened to me. I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Projects, an African-American inner city community, which had been six miles away from where I'd lived most of my time in New Orleans anyway. But we never venture into those parts of the cities because we have fear. We have been made afraid of the poor. Not completely without cause, but fear can so build up inside of us that we don't have freedom of movement. Oh, you're not going into that neighborhood, are you? You know? And the gospel of Jesus is a liberating gospel. All religion, when it is what it's supposed to be doing, connects people with each other, overcomes prejudice, and liberates people to move and be with one another as human beings. That is what religion is supposed to be about. But religion is real kinky. It is kinky, kinky, kinky. And it can, it can get distorted in a thousand ways before you get it right, as I was learning, because all the theology I had studied had not prepared me for the gospel of justice. And then when I did read the gospel and see who Jesus was with and how he broke across these holiness codes, cleanliness codes, he touched people unclean. Well, that was the way it shook down in that day. You didn't touch people who weren't clean or didn't go to the temple or whatever. And we got our own kind today, and we have to decide and know what that is and then, then cross it. So then I go into the St. Thomas Housing Projects, African-American people, in apartment 519C, five nuns in there with all the people of St. Thomas. But by the time I got there, the sisters had already been there seven years, eight years, and they had built trust with the people. By the time I got there and walked through the neighborhood, they all called me sister. No word ever sounded more delicious in my ears when they said, hey, sister. I mean, any white people they, they saw, they called sister. Even when the brothers came, they called them sister too. <laughs> I mean, Brother Joe Porter, he had a big beard, you know, and the kids going, hey, sister. And he's going, look, look, I'm, I'm a man, I'm a brother, huh? 
hey, sister, brother. And, and, but trust, of course, is from being there and accompanying people. And Sister Laurie Schaff, who began Hope House and the St. Thomas Housing Projects in New Orleans there, she didn't have a blueprint in her back pocket when she went. She didn't know. It's not like she great white woman's going to go in there and save all these poor black folks and be their little white savior. Nuh-uh. She's just going to go there and be sister to them and accompany them. And then one thing for sure, education, help people. I'm working in the Adult Learning Center for High School Dropouts and watching as people come in. I went to an excellent private school, to an elementary school, to a high school, to an excellent college. And people are coming into the Adult Learning Center and that's where, really where it hit home to me. Here was the city of New Orleans. We lived in the same city. And people were going to school, and we'd give them a reading test. Well, okay, let's just see how you are in the reading here. How far did you get? 11th grade. All right, let's see how you're doing on the reading. And they can't read it at a third grade level. And I'm going, how can this be? That in this city, this could happen to people. And then where's their future? You drop out of school, or even if you graduate from high school and you can't read, and you're significantly limited in how you can write, where's your little train ride onto the great American dream? And so people drop out. And then where you can't get decent jobs, drugs become a sub-economy when the economy isn't working for you. It's a sub-economy. The kids wise up real fast. They should see who's coming in with the gold chains and who's got the nice car. And they know, know if they go work at that McDonald's for minimum wage, they're still in poverty. And so here's a kid 12 years old being given a $20 bill to run that little white bag of powder right down the street to so-and-so there. And the kid looks at the $20 bill in his hands. And you can see them. You can see them getting into it. I was in that context. I was in that fabric. When I came out of the Adult Learning Center one day and a friend who had been in the prison coalition office happened to be coming down St. Andrew Street, and I tell about this in the book, he meets me. Whoever he met that day was asking him to be part of a pen pal project to write to prisoners in Louisiana on death row. He meets me. Hey, Sister Ellen, you want to be a pen pal, somebody on death row? And I say, sure. I didn't think about it. I knew if he was sitting on death row, he was poor. I, I'm going to learn a lot about the death penalty in this whole thing. I knew this for starters, and most people do. If you sitting on death row in this country, anywhere, including New York, you're poor. Because if you're not poor, you know what happens. Right. You can get your little Johnny Cochran dream team of defense and go in there. And, and the prosecutor will think ten times before... It, he or she even brings it to trial because you're up against such defense and you don't want to go in there and lose. So they're much more prone to plea bargain when they're up against a real good defense. And so it was enough for me that he was poor and he was sitting on death row. And I knew my ministry, my job was to work with people in education there and to help them get back and get their GED, that priceless stuff that you can help people with. So I sat down at night and I wrote a letter to a man by the name of Patrick Sonier. Dear Mr. Sonier, I'm Sister Helen. I'm writing to you because I heard you're on death row. And then I just basically upheld his dignity as a human being. And I just said, they told me you didn't like to write letters very much, but I just want to let you know I will write to you even if you never write me back. Because you're a son of God, whatever you have done, you have a dignity that's worth more than the worst thing you ever did in your life. And I'll mail a letter, and I never even expected to hear from the guy because they said he was a loner and he didn't write back. And one week later, there's a letter, dear Sister Helen. I couldn't believe it when a guard stopped by my cell, said, hey, Sonia, you got a letter, and you wasn't writing anybody. I figured I was going to try to go it alone. I figured they're going to kill me anyway. Like, why be close to anybody? And that's a big question of people on death row. Do you get close to somebody who's in the cell next to you? And then maybe have to watch as they walked out by the guards to their deaths? Do you achieve any kind of friendship and intimacy only to be deprived of the person when they're killed? I'm writing a story right now called Innocence Betrayed, about three innocent people on death row. One is Joseph Odell in Virginia. He watched as 22 people 
in the 11 years he was on death row in Virginia, 22 people walked out by the guards in the black uniforms to their deaths. And he got within five days of death in the four holding cells right near the execution chamber, and his cell was right across from a shower. And he watched as the people to be executed, two people, were taken into the shower, then put a, a white jumpsuit put on them, and then taken out and killed, and one of them was his good friend. And he had watched 22 people. So he's saying in the letter, like, why well, be close to anybody? But he said, I got your letter. It came out of the blue, and I would love to be your pen pal. And we began to write letters. And then it all unfolded from there. When we are, now the newspapers and the journalists call me this nun activist. I didn't know I was an activist. I, I didn't set out to be an activist. But you begin to act for justice. You begin to take one step, and you don't know where the step is going to lead you. It's integral and whole, and you do it because it has integrity to it. You do it for its own sake. You don't do it that, oh, one day I'll do this, and then I'll write a book, and they'll make a movie, and I'll be famous. <laughs> There's a principle in the spiritual life. We do what we do for its own integrity, and we don't seek the fruit of our actions. We do them because they're right, and they're just. And I love what the feminist theologians are saying. You know, that the essence of morality is right relationships. Right relationships with everybody. And so I wrote the letter. And he wrote back. And he had nobody to come and see him. And so I wrote and said, I will come and see you. And it all unfurled from there because when I wrote and filled out the form to go be his visitor, I have no idea when I filled out spiritual advisor that they are going to kill him in the electric chair on the night of April the 5th, 1984, and at quarter to six in the evening, everybody leaves except the spiritual advisor who can walk with him and be with him at the end, and I will find myself saying to him, Pat, Pat, look, when they do this, you look at me, look at my face, and I will be the face of Christ for you. I will be the face of love for you. And having strength... When I said that, people said to me, oh, you have such courage. I don't have courage. We, none of us have courage. We do what we have to do out of the integrity of it, and grace and strength and courage is given to us. You don't have to do it ahead of time. You don't have to plan it out ahead of time. You follow. You follow with integrity and with love and with care, and everything comes when we need it. That's the meaning of grace. It's the meaning of people in religious terms put it in different ways. God's presence, grace, however, in the different religious traditions it's put. I go to visit him in his prison. I take you with me. I wrote the book in the present tense, so it's all unfolding. For you when you read it, for me as I experienced it. And it was scary. They were talking about going to Bedford, to the women's prison. That is great that Barnard has this program where you're connected with the women in Bedford Prison, that is a wonderful thing. And any of you students who are here are lucky and blessed to be part of a college that does that. I go in, I'm scared out of my cotton picking mind. I've never been in a prison in my life. Southern prisons, I had heard of. I had heard of people who had visited. You know, spiritual advisors, people who were, you know, strip search when you go in and all that. I'm going, oh God. You know, when you go into the prison, you got to understand New Orleans is real, real Catholic. I mean, like, really Catholic. I mean, like, the nuns can ride the buses free. <laughs> Catholic. I mean, like, everybody going crazy on Mardi Gras Day and Ash Wednesday in lines in the church to get ashes on their forehead. Catholic. That's what I'm talking about. So we got a lot of respect. Sister, how you doing? All that. I walk in this prison. They have a big old green sign when you walk in. Anybody stepping onto prison property subjects yourself to body search, strip searches, dog sniffing. I'll stop reading the sign. I mean, my fingertips were cold. My heart was going. And then the guards started leading me through these gates. Clang, clang. No soft sounds in prison. Some people, I was in a church in New Jersey. A nice little church. And people afterwards looked at me very sincerely, 
says, we've heard about these prisons, how they have weightlifting and color TV and computers and all. Seems to me that they're country clubs, these prisons. And I knew those people hadn't been anywhere near a state penal institution where when that gate is locked behind you, you don't have any freedom over your body or your environment. And you don't know who you're going to be sleeping next to in a cot or a bunk. And you don't know if somebody has an eye or a group of people have an eye to rape you. Or, you I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine? I remember a man, Bobby Leonard, describing to me when he was a young black man going into an adult prison, and he looked around, he saw the people, and he said, I know they were all looking at me and they thinking, fresh meat. And that's the way you feel. And then you've got to begin, and what if you got a life sentence the rest of your life? You're going to be in this place. These long sentences that we're giving to people in prisons. And we incarcerate in this country, two million people are in prison right now. One in every seven black men in this country can't vote because they got a felony record. One in every four black men, young black men from the ages of 18 to 29 are in the prison system in this country. We're building a country for the poor. And instead of dealing with the social problems, with the deep roots of violence in our society, we build another country on the other side of prison walls. So we are the highest incarcerator in the world. Russia used to be higher than us, and now Russia is going down in its prison population, and we are going up. And about eight years ago, for the first time, California's budget, that the education budget dipped down below the prison budget, and more is going for prison than is going for education. Now, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with those priorities and those values. When I go to visit this man, Pat Sonier. The biggest surprise was when I looked at his face, I, c I couldn't believe how human he was. I mean, I guess in the back of my mind, I guess in the back of everybody's mind, we build up this image, oh, if he kills somebody, he must be like a, a kind of monster or he's not as human, you know, as we are. And when I looked through the grate at this man, Patrick Sonier, I'd been writing the letters to I couldn't believe the humanness of his face. And he said, Sister, you came. You drove all that way, just like you said you would. And the two hours flew by. And mostly it was him talking, because he had a listening, compassionate presence who would receive him and who would show him dignity. Found out his brother, Eddie, was serving two life sentences for the same murder. And that was my first question about the legal system. Now, my daddy was a lawyer. But when he'd do all that legal talk and that lawyer talk, man, I would tune that out. You got to want to listen to lawyerly talk if they get into those discussions. And I see Ron Tabak standing here, one of the most stalwart people in this state who has educated people on the death penalty and called for it and is working for an end of, to the death penalty in New York State. You have a real hero here. And afterwards, we're going to ask you to come up, Ron. You can't see him. He's up against the wall. Turn to the side there, Ryan. Let's get that little profile shot. <laughs> He's a good lawyer. He's a hero lawyer. He's one of those lawyers that cares about the human rights for people and struggles against great odds. And I meet the man. I find out then that Eddie's doing two life sentences, and that was my first question about the legal system. How did one brother get death and one brother get life for murder? How did that come down? I don't know the answer yet. When you read Dead Man Walking, you're going to have all the answer you need because I'm going to come to understand about the legal system. I'm going to come to understand. You know why poor people are on death row? Yeah, sometimes poor people do terrible crimes. They do. But why is it only poor people get selected? Why is it in the 12,000 or 13,000 murders in this country every year, 1.5, 2% of people are selected for death and they're always poor? 98.5 percent of people on death row are poor. And you know why they get death? It's because it's the kind of defense they're able to get because they don't have money to put in for good resources and expert witnesses and jury profiles and they go into the system and if you think of it like baseball teams, one, one team is uh, going out on the field with great uniforms, a great coach, a place to practice. The other team's coming out on the field with shaggy-looking, borrowed T-shirts, a part-time coach, no place to practice where they have to borrow places and play at midnight. And that's what we have in this country. 
all over. And so it's no secret we've freed 98 innocent people off a of death row in this country. You know why? They're all poor and then you look at their trials and that's the story I'm going to tell in this book, Innocence Betrayed. What happened to them when they went into the courtroom? They made mincemeat out of them because they didn't have the defense to raise the question or to make objections, formal objections that later in appeals court will hear. you got to do it in a formal way. you got to know the law. You have to be aggressive. You've got to get in there and you've got to make the law work for you. And if you don't know how to jump through those hoops and you don't know the legal system, you get creamed. And lo and behold, you're, you're sitting there and you hear the jury saying, we, are there. we find them guilty of death. We sentence them to death and they can't believe it. Especially innocent people can't believe it because they know they're innocent and they just think, well, all I've got to do is tell them my story. I know if I could just tell them my story and where I was. That was Joseph Adele. That's the, his story, Dobie Williams, the other one I'm t I write about, an African-American. I was with him for seven years. IQ was 68, railroaded, all-white jury, taken by the police in the middle of the night. They said he confessed. Where's the confession? Oh, the tape broke down. But these police officers will tell you what he said. All three of them will tell you what he said. Where's the videotape? Well, that broke down too. No recorded confession but the word of police officers who say with this young black man alone and taken in the middle of the night confess to them. The name of the book is Innocence Betrayed and you know what I figured out while I'm writing this book? It's not just the people on death row who are innocent who are betrayed. We're all betrayed. We all are betrayed. And the prosecutors start getting betrayed too because they get into this mentality that to be a judge, especially in certain pockets in this country, Philadelphia, you got a, a DA that goes for the death penalty every chance she gets. In, in Harris County, Texas, accounts for one-fifth of all the people on death row. Louisiana, Doug Morrow's office and the DA's office in Baton Rouge. A reporter from the Morning Advocate found out that whenever they got a death sentence, they took the whole staff out to celebrate in a pricey restaurant in Baton Rouge. Why? Because they had won. And see, when you get in this winning thing, it blurs to exactly what winning means. Winning means, oh yeah, winning means that we got a death sentence. That he got life without possibility of parole. No, that's not winning. It's got to be death. And once they get that taste of blood, that it's got to be death, Something in them gets coarsened, and it gets weakened, and it betrays their own best selves as well. Prosecutors, jurors, being sent in there to play God, close the doors. Now you decide. Look at the mitigation. Look at this terrible crime, and you tell us, does this person deserve to live or die? What about them? Everybody. Well, driving home from seeing Pat Sonia that first day, he, didn't, he hadn't talked about the crime. And just instinctively and because of respect for him, I decided that he would tell me about it when he was ready. But I also didn't want to be naive. And so over several months when I began to go see Pat, I would also visit with his brother. And then I'm in the, the prison coalition office. And I say, could I have some background information on the Sonia case? And they say, sure. And they bring out all these folders. Legal folders always look so bland, those little manila colored folders and then you open them up and I opened them up the one on the top of the heap and looked into the faces of two beautiful teenage kids Loretta Bork 18 David LeBlanc 17 in their little prom outfits on the front page of the Daily Iberian a place in Louisiana called Acadiana where the Cajun people live and the terrible headline teenagers found murdered and then I read the story. I read the story of how after a football game on a Friday night, David and Loretta had gone to a little lover's lane near a sugar cane field near St. Martinville. These two brothers that I'm visiting, Patrick and Eddie Sonier, rabbit hunting in the field, have rifles, teenagers pull up. They had done this with other teenage couples because they came forward when David and Loretta were killed. They go up to the car. They say to the kids, you realize you're trespassing. We're the security uh, officers for these people here. This private property. That led to, well, if the girl has sex with us, we won't report you. They had done that to five other couples. This night, 
They tried it again, but this night it ended that David, LeBlanc, and Loretta bore a lion face down with their faces in the wet grass near that sugar cane field, and they each have three bullet holes from a twenty-two rifle in the back of their heads. And I read this. And now I know the other side. I know that the man I'm going to visit on death row with a nice smile, who was so glad to see me, who said, thank you, Sister Helen, for coming. And Eddie, who has the beautiful tapered hands, like a concert pianist, that those hands of those two brothers had killed those two young people. And I felt, and I feel, there's no way to talk about this without feeling, again, the outrage. And that had happened in 1977. By the time I visited, uh, Patrick Sonier was in 1982. So already five years had elapsed, and when I came into it, and then I looked into their faces, and once you have this terrible knowledge of something in your soul, you can't be the same. Their tension opened up. In the Gulf of Mexico, when the deep waters of the Gulf meet the shallow waters, there's something called an ebb tide, and you see like a, a line of foam where the waters meet. Well, like a permanent ebb tide, and I think, oh, these poor kids, oh, these poor parents, because this is every parent's worst nightmare, that your kids go out on a Friday night and they don't come home. And then there was a part of me that thought, I ought to go see those parents. Everybody was Catholic in this. Pat and Eddie Sonier were Catholic, the LeBlancs, their son David, the Bourks, me. I'm thinking, I ought to go see them. And then I was scared to go see them, because I'm picturing like, God, they're going to be so upset. I'm, I'm going to see the people that killed the child. I mean, they're not going to exactly say you want some tea. These people are going to be upset. I mean, and I'm not above paranoia because I could picture the headline, nun shot on front porch. I mean, <laughs> because when I moved into St. Thomas, I had never seen violence. You know, I was seeing violence all around me. And so it's like I'm not naive about violence and how it gets triggered, you know. And then I think I'll only make it worse because they're bound to be mad at me. They're bound to be for the death penalty and want to see him die. I'll only make it worse if they ask me, well, sister, you be with us when I execute to God? We want to see justice done? Can you stand with us in that? And what was I going to say to these people? And I don't want to say to them, I'm hanging on by the tips of my moral fingernails, but in principle I can't say yes. That Yeah, yeah, I do. I'll stand with you in that. I believe that. And so I stayed away. I stayed away. I didn't do one thing. I didn't call them. I didn't write them a card. And I meet them at the worst possible time you would want to meet victims' families because it was at the pardon board hearing, which is the last public act before someone's executed in Louisiana. You have a pardon board hearing. All the victims' family, all of their friends, all their relatives come. There were only three people in the room who was speaking for Patrick Sonier not to be executed, the lawyer Millard Farmer, a psychiatrist Brad Fisher, and me. And all the rest of the people in the room were there to see that the execution would proceed, including the victims' families. And while the pardon board is in voting, we walk in outside, and I bump into both of the parents. The Borks first were coming. They see me. Their daughter had been killed. They were so angry at me, they just kind of averted their faces and walked past me in stony silence. And right behind them is Lloyd LeBlanc and his wife, Eula, their son, David, had been killed. And I couldn't escape. And I braced myself inside like, this is going to be terrible. And up they walk. And you know, human beings, we can never put human beings in a box. Never. We can't put death row inmates in a box. We can't put anybody in a box. And we can't put victims' families in a box. Later, I'm going to meet a whole host of victims' families that are going to be like this man I'm about to meet. And he comes up to me, he's, and Lloyd LeBlanc, and he says, Sister Ellen, I'm Lloyd LeBlanc. This is my wife, Eula. It's our son, David, who was killed. He said, Sister Ellen, where have you been? We haven't had anybody to talk to. You can't believe the pressure on us because of this death penalty. Where have you been? You've been all this time. You've been going to visit Pat and Eddie Sonia. You didn't want to come see us. We haven't had anybody to talk to in this. And I'm so shocked and dumbfounded by this man. It was such a lame excuse. I just said, 
Oh, Mr. Bob, sorry, I, I didn't think you'd want to see me. So pitiful. And he looks at me and he goes, he's real Frenchy, okay, he's Cajun. And they go, you know, me in French, but he goes, me sister? Me sister, you don't know what I think unless you're going to come over there, we're going to talk about it, you're going to find out what I think. <laughs> and I wanted to say, Mr. Blanc, you don't know what a coward you're talking to. I mean, I, and this man takes me by the hand invites me over to his house. I go and pray with him in this little chapel. I had never prayed along somebody who prayed for everybody. I mean, he not only prayed for David and for his wife, Eula, who cried for three years, day and night, cried for her son, David, who was lost. They had to move his grave right next to the house. And every day, and this is 20-something years later, she can see from her kitchen window the little red vigil light that burns on David's grave. And she can't make it through her day without visiting that grave. People's lives are changed forever. It's happened to all of these human beings that we are mourning today and over these weeks and months here in New York who went to work and suddenly they are no more on this earth. It's unbelievable to us when we hear the story. Well, every one of these victims' families that I met went through this. He went through this. He and Eula went through this, that they lost David. They lost David when he was 17 years old. And they're not just going to lose him once. As one of the victims said in the Oklahoma City thing when they were all asking, oh, man, isn't it going to be great? You're going to get to see Timothy McVeigh dying. You're going to get some closure on this. And one of the woman, women said, look, you close a house. You close on a house, you don't close on a death. Because every day of their lives, their loved one will be present to them. It's a deep mourning that's beyond words. We're into the realm of human mystery of suffering here that we, we can't comprehend and we don't claim to. And here he is praying then for Lloyd, I mean for uh, the Bork family and for David and his wife. Then lo and behold, he's praying for Pat and Eddie Sonia. He's praying for Mrs. Sonia. Mrs. Sonia, the mother of Pat and Eddie Sonia in this little town of St. Martinville, couldn't go to the store anymore because when she'd be in the store, she could overhear people saying, there she is, that white trash mother. That's the two boys that killed the Bork and the LeBlanc children. And she couldn't stand to hear him talk like that, and so she began to be like a little recluse in the house, and she unplugged the TV set because she saw the pending execution of her son Patrick and their faces, his face up on the screen. People were cutting up dead cats and throwing them on her front porch. You can't look like a little encircled laser beam around a death row inmate or someone targeted for death in society and not know that there's going to be a mother, there's going to be a father, there's going to be brothers and sisters. And Tim Robbins brought out in the film that last scene before Matthew Poncelet goes to his death, his mama and his three brothers and the conversation they have. And I have witnessed this five times with families. Watched mothers take their sons in their arms for the last time to tell them goodbye because their sons, they know it's the last time they're going to see them alive. Teresa Celestine, leaving Wellie Celestine, she, I noticed she just kind of pecked him on the cheek, walked out. They had a prison vehicle waiting for her. I could see her, and Willie couldn't. I was like catacorner, and he could see me seeing his mother, and he said, Sister, how's my mama doing? And I watched as she left the death house, collapse over the hood of the prison vehicle, sobbing. And I looked him straight in the eye and I said, Willie, she's doing fine. And later, Teresa Celestine told me, Sister, Sister, if I had put my arms around my boy, no guard could have pried my arms loose. Are we dealing with the violence of crime? Or are we creating other victims' families? Is this the only thing we know to do? to have violent solutions for those who have done violence. And what we say in here in microcosm on the death penalty, expand it out, expand it out to what happened in this city. Listen to the language. All we can think to do is target the enemy, get the enemy, kill the enemy. And then what would we have reaped? 
where will we be then? When will we as a society begin to start to probe underneath what causes violence in our society and to address the root solutions so that we do not choose violent solutions to try to solve our social problems? What will it take for us as a country to have that kind of spiritual and moral reflection that we can go to a deeper level? I don't know. Telling stories helps. Bringing people there. Helping reflection. All of that plays a part to be a peaceful society. But if we're going to be a peaceful society, we have to have peaceful structures. We have to have peaceful economics. We have to treat people with respect. We have to have decent education. And if we don't work with all those things, and then say, oh, we're going to be tough on crime when people commit the crimes, and then just blame the individual for the crime. Did you do it? Yeah, you did. Don't tell me about your poor background. Don't tell me about how your mother was a drug addict. You knew better. You know right from wrong. As though we don't live in a context. As if trees don't grow in a soil. Of course we live in a context. We live in a society. Of course we are affected by everything around us. The students at Barnard, look at you. You're some of the most privileged young people in our society because you're going to a school like this. Me too. I'm privileged. I had privilege. I went to a school like this too. Why us? Why do we go to such a school? Why do we have the resources around us so we can develop our gifts and give them back into society? Is it because we're more deserving? We have more virtue? We have more merit? Is it? And when we've been given gifts, see all those gifts I was given? Of public speaking, of writing. I didn't know how I was going to use those gifts. But when we begin, when we put our boat on the current and we begin to get involved, pick an issue, put your hand on the rope anywhere, women's issues, children's issues, anywhere, it doesn't matter because they're all connected. And so you can put your hand on the rope and maybe you don't say, I don't know what I'm doing. I never did anything like this before. I've never been the activist sort. By putting your hand on the rope and beginning to do it and then it leads you. It teaches you, you follow it, and then you meet incredible human beings that you're going to look at who are at your side, who are also engaged. Students on this campus doing a campaign to end the death penalty. You're young. You already understand the death penalty isn't a solution, and you're doing something about it. They're sitting at those tables tonight, and you have a chance for action tonight. First action, put your name, which only you can give, on that signature on the petition to call for a moratorium on the death penalty in this country. And New York is particularly pitiful. I have to tell you this. Your governor, George Pataki, almost made me wreck the community car when I heard him on national public radio when he was running for governor. And what made me almost wreck the car was he was saying, well, it'll deter crime in New York. It will deter crime, he said. The police chiefs of this country, when given 10 ways to stop crime, all put the death penalty dead last. Do you know why? Because they know that the people doing the thinking and the people doing the murdering are two separate sets of people. I mean, at Barnard, you reflect on things. Now, what are the consequences of this if we do this? All right, that's what education's about. But people whose lives are chaos, who have no future and no hope, laced with alcohol and drugs and a gun in their hand, they explode into violence. And they don't think of consequences. You think they're going to sit at the kitchen table in the morning? Oh, I don't know if I'll do that. Maybe I'll get the death penalty. Or maybe I'll just get life without possibility of parole. <laughs> we got A and B. Which should it be? The police know it. The wardens of prisons know it. It doesn't deter anybody. The states that have the death penalty have over half the, I mean, double the homicide rate of states that don't. And what did Pataki say? Deter crime. I got a chance to be opposite him on Crossfire one night. <laughs> and it was after the movie, Tim Robbins had been invited. He was keeping a low profile while the film was coming out because he wanted people to know the film wasn't a polemic. I was tired. It was the end of a week. I never dreamed you were going to be doing all these media interviews because they happened to do a movie about you. I didn't know that came with the territory. So I had done media interview after media interview. It was Friday night. 
We're going to have a beer, run a film, relax, kick up our feet. And Tim calls. He says, uh, Helen, I got an invitation to be on Crossfire. I said, great, Tim. That's a great idea, Tim. You go to Crossfire, Tim. <laughs> and he goes, Helen, I don't think so because I see I'm trying to keep this low profile. And then he adds, but I think somebody ought to go. <laughs> and you know, you, you're going back and then suddenly you know what you're supposed to do. And I go on down to the TV station. They don't even have a chair for me to sit on. I had a stool. I can't see who I'm up against. They only have a little ear thing to connect me. And then they tell me, oh, sister, by the way, you'll be up against George Pataki, governor of New York. I sprang to life. <laughs> Where are you now in New York since you have put the death penalty into effect? You've been through, Ron, what, you know this up, the stats on it, over? Six on death row. Six on death row after going through how many possible capital cases? <laughs> Several hundred. Several hundred to the tune of? Millions of dollars. Yeah, at least. Three of those six are from the hotbed of murder in the state. Suffolk County, 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 <laughs> Suffolk County, hot bed of murder. Is he being sarcastic? Okay. <laughs> Just spent over $80 million to do that, to get six trophies. Because look, look at the politics of the death penalty. And not just George Pataki. When he had the presidential debate, you had George Bush and Al Gore saying, well, why are you for, you for the death penalty? Oh, it would be a deterrent. they got to legitimize it. They can't say... We're for very selective vengeance of 1.5 to 2 percent of the people who commit the death penalty. They can't say that. But we got to know that. We got to know our Constitution. And we, the people, have to call for change. That's the way things change. That's what we have to be about. I end up getting involved with victims' families, and we start a group called Survive. It's not the answer to everything. It's one little candle burning in New Orleans where victims' families know that they can come. And that's when I learned about race and the death penalty. That race and the death penalty is not just about the disproportionate number of people of color who go onto death row, but it has everything to do with the race of the victim. That when white people are killed in this country is when they go gung-ho for the death penalty. When people of color are killed, they don't, many times, don't even prosecute the case or send out investigators. I gave a talk in Washington, New Jersey, African-American woman came up to get her book signed afterwards. She said, I have had five people killed in my family, including my husband, and the DA's office hadn't prosecuted one of them. White people have value. White people have dignity in this society. Judges are white. DA's overwhelmingly are white. Juries are white. And it's an identification thing. It's not that people plan to be mean. Ooh, let's only go if it's the white people are killed. It's an identification. Somebody like us got killed. People of color, I don't know them. They, 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 they're different from me. Because we don't mix in this society. And that's a gift of going to Barnard, that you're with people of different races and ethnic groups, and you can talk to each other and meet each other and learn human beings. And so I make my way down both of those roads in the ebb tide of those waters, the victims' families going to the meetings, hearing their sorrow, and then unbelievably to me accompanying a man to the electric chair on the night of April 5th, 1984. I never dreamed when I go with Patrick Sonier that he is only going to be the first and that there would be four others. Never dream of that. Don't know that. Just know this man being in the death house with him three days before he's to be killed. And I'd been with people in the hospital before who are dying and they're fading and they're losing consciousness. But here's this man, he's drinking black coffee and he's talking to me the way we could, well, at least that I'm talking, you mostly are listening right now. <laughs> because he was alive. And the birds are chirping in the eaves there, the coffee pot's percolating. The, then you hear somebody typing up the forms. What is she typing? The witness forms. What witness forms? Well, the witnesses who are gonna witness the execution tonight and they're gonna come in this room, they put a tablecloth over the table where the witnesses were signed. And Pat can see all of this going on. He can hear the wish of the door every time the front door of the death house was, would open. And we see 
as the uh, electrician comes in to test the electric chair to make sure the electricity is working. He sees as the witnesses begin to come in. He sees as each of the associate wardens in their little three-piece suits come in because this is a big event in the prison. They're all going to be there tonight. What's happening tonight? They're going to kill a man tonight. They're going to kill him in the electric chair. And there's a politeness. There's a protocol. There's a, I don't know how to tell you this. It's in the book, but it was like the most surreal thing I ever experienced in my life. Because the only way I know Pat's going to die is with my mind. It's 10 o'clock at night. It's 11. At 12, they're going to do this. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations approved by all the member states in 1948 says in Articles 3 and 5, Article 3, every human being has a right to life. Article 5, no human being shall be subjected to cruel and degrading punishment or torture. Is the death penalty torture? They go, man, look, all they do, they get a little lethal injection, which Ronald Reagan thought of when he was governor of California. One day he said, Look, the veterinarians like to put the horses down and animals, you know, when they inject them, maybe we could do that with the criminals. Real good idea. Most states have lethal injection now. But then it was electrocution. Is it torture? Is it torture? As Joseph Odell sat in his cell, waited to be the next one to go to watch other people being taken out, led through a green metal door, and you never see them again because they've been killed? Is it torture to wake up in the middle of the night because you've had the same nightmare, they're coming for you. You can hear the guards. They come into your cell. They're unlocking it. They're saying, okay, Sonia, time to go. And they're dragging you. You're struggling. You're kicking. You're struggling against them. And they're taking you to the execution chamber. And you wake up. And you're in a sweat. And you go, oh, no. It was just a dream. It's not tonight. And then one night, the real night does come. And there's your mother going through it. And you're powerless to help her and she's suffering, and your little brothers and sisters are suffering, and there's nothing you can do. Is that torture? Amnesty International defines torture as an extreme mental or physical assault on someone rendered defenseless. Are we practicing torture in the United States by having the death penalty? And do you think it matters that you're going to be strapped onto a gurney like this, or strapped into a chair, or strapped into a chair in a gas chamber, or sat in a chair with a little red heart pinned over your heart where the rifles are going to aim for your death, or hanging, though hanging's going out. Listen to this story, Creativity in Washington State. A death row inmate figured out, he read it, how heavy you had to be that if you were hanged, it would decapitate you. So he proceeded to put himself on a weight program. The opposite of losing weight, he determined to gain weight till he got to that point. I don't know, 250 pounds, 60, I don't know, I don't remember what it was. And then he submitted to the Supreme Court of the state that it would be tortured to hang him because he would be decapitated. And they were furious, but he was right, it saved his life. Now he has to be on Weight Watchers ever since. <laughs> but I mean, he's alive, he's alive. Pat Sonier, when you read the story, when you read about his lawyers, he and Eddie, these lawyers, this lawyer had visited with him for two half hour periods to prepare his defense, did a flurry of motions, pretrial motions the day before the trial, did nothing for him. And then it's all over. It, we waiting on the appeals courts, everything's washing through. And it's so incredible. He was preparing himself for death, but of course, I was with Dobie three times in the death house, two times, one hour and a half before he was about to walk. The, the phone rang, and it was the Supreme Court, and he got a stay of execution. They turned him around, put him in his cell, and he comes back to do it again. Second time, same thing happens. They th he thinks he's dead. They serving him his last meal. Nope, stay of execution. He walks out that time with a little carry-out container of fried shrimp to bring to the rest of the guy on death row who all thought they'd seen Dobie for the last time. Because it's human. It's human, and we can make mistakes, and we can do legal orders. One more legal question here. 
Robert Wayne Williams was walking to the electric chair en route. They turned him around to go back to his cell for one more hour while they looked at a legal question, then came and got him and killed him. Is this torture? Can we face it? Can we look at it? Can we see it? And do we have to keep doing it? And in the end, I walk with this man, and I, he said to me, Sister, look, Sister, you can't be there at the end because cause like it could scar you to see this. He was trying to protect me. I'd written to him, and I'd visited him for two and a half years. And I said, Pat, no doubt I'll fall apart afterwards. Whatever happens to me, there's no way you're going to die alone without a loving face to see, and don't you worry about me. And that was the way it was. And he looked at me, and mine was the last face he saw before they killed him. And I came out of that execution chamber traumatized like many people are in this city today. You know, after a while, the numbers, because to watch one human being be killed in this relentless, preconceived way like this, I came out. The sisters were waiting. They had been praying outside. They put a coat around me. I was so cold. That's what I remember. I just got cold on the inside. Put a coat around me, had a car, put me in the car. We start to drive down the road, and I say, stop the car because I have to throw up. I'd never watched anybody be killed. It didn't matter that it was a so-called legal thing. What does that matter? It's like when a state kills, we always try to legalize what we do. Guess what they have to write on a death certificate when they execute somebody? What do you write? Failure to breathe? You have to put it. You have to state the truth of what you did. They have to write homicide, the killing of a human being. They sometimes put legal in front of it, but it's a homicide. They have to write its name. At least on the death certificate, the truth gets written. So I want to invite you, we're going to have a little discussion back and forth here, but to sign up for the moratorium campaign, to get the book tonight. If anybody here has a rich aunt, we have books signed by Susan Sarandon and Susan Graham, who portrayed me in the opera. And it is coming to the New York City Opera, the Opera of Dead Man Walking. It premiered in San Francisco in October, and it is dynamite. It brings modern opera to another whole level. Anyway, so those books are $100, and it's given to the moratorium campaign. All the, everything in it goes to the moratorium campaign. And I ask you to sign that petition, and then the students here to join on with the students for the Campaign Against Death Penalty to be an active part of this. And uh, I don't know if we have membership things out there for moratorium campaign, but ask the students and the, and the faculty uh, to join and to become a member with us. That's my invitations, and that's my speech, and so now let's talk. Okay, there's the mic. Is that the only mic we got right there? Yes. Afterwards, I'll be glad to sign books for you if you want to stay. But let's have a conversation, especially now in New York at this time. Do you see any connection between what's going on here and what I was talking about tonight, what happened on Tuesday? Hi. It's, is it on? Oh. Um, Speak up. Okay. So what do you think if they uh, do identify anyone alive who had something to do with the tragedy on Tuesday, what do you propose as a solution? May I ask you what you think? I think the reasons for it are really complex and uh, not nearly as simple as, as what people are saying and what the general um, What's the simple is. thing you don't believe in? Where, do people, uh, where are they oversimplifying it? And just pointing blame and just scapegoating and just saying... Uh, Who did this? Let's yeah, get Yeah, this is one person or this is one mentality or they hate us, they hate our they way hate of life. They hate us, right. I think it has a lot more to do with, um, with our relationship with other people and other nations mm -hmm. than just an answer as simplistic as that. Right. So bringing these people to justice, what do you think that might mean? 
other than killing them. That's not acceptable. I don't know. Um, I don't know what justice would be. I mean, I think. I don't know if it's an, an, a question of justice. I think it's more a question of uh, understanding how this could have happened and how to prevent it again in the future. And then the people who are suffering, helping them to understand that so that it eases their pain. I don't know if it's a question of justice. Okay, okay. Thanks, you got us started on this. I want to hear from other people. I'll be glad to tell you what I think. But let's just hear other people. Okay, it can't be just our row that's going to talk. <laughs> Which row is this? That row, prize row. Okay. Um, I was uh, very excited to hear you actually bring up the presidential debates because that's when I got involved with the death penalty. As soon as I heard no kidding. these two people defending um, the death penalty as um, a deterrent for crime, I picked up the phone, I called Death Penalty Focus, I got involved in California, and I just moved to New York. So I was very excited that Barnard was doing this tonight, because I need to get hooked up in this That's town. That's great. Um, what what was it that so incensed you when you heard him say the deterrent thing? I think to your point earlier that the people who are subjected to the decision of people in a position of power and a position of privilege are themselves at a point in their lives or a point in their road where their options have been cut off, where their resources have been cut off, if they were ever there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And one of the most disturbing things that I've found in the days since the, since the tragedies in New York and Washington is that our government and our law enforcement people are using the word justice in a way that I cannot identify with. Their justice means get them and kill them. Vengeance, mm -hmm. and that's that's not Except what I believe. I don't believe that mm -hmm. there's a God who's a God of vengeance okay. in this way. Yeah, and I think that the cover people's of the God image definitely comes out in the death penalty. Who don't tell me if you believe in God or not. Who's your God? And if you're for the death penalty, you believe. That's the kind of God you do believe in. And this is a very, I think, profound problem when we look at the cover of the Daily News today, which carries the face of one of the men who was arrested in Boston, who may or may not have anything to do with this, and it's an Arab face. And the headline in the paper is, this is the face of terror. This is the face of death. And wow. there is nothing, there is no... There's a rhetoric of death, and there's a rhetoric of vengeance, and there, is, there are very few people who have the courage to speak, I think, for healing. Yeah. That I, I don't know what that means. I don't know how we can start. I think that this is a start. I think that prayer is a start. I think that coming together in a community is the method by which we can not only gather ourselves together to pray for those who were killed, who were affected very, very viscerally by this event. But we can pray for ourselves and we can pray for knowledge okay. of a God that is All just. Right. Thank you very much. That was good. Good points. Real good points. Yes? I'm not from that row. You're Anyhow, not what? I'm not from the row that okay. the previous two speakers have been from. Anyhow, I never really thought about the death penalty much before your speech tonight. And I honestly don't know how I feel about it. But you made the connection to the tragedy that happened earlier this week. And just thinking about it over the, pa over the course of your speech, because that occurred to me when you began speaking, the connection. I really, I don't think that the death penalty is the answer, but I can't come up with a better one. I don't think that the death penalty is the answer, though, for a different reason than raised before. The death penalty only allows the victims to die once, and they've killed, so far, hundreds of people. So how can... We face that with Timothy McVeigh, 168. Exactly. He said, I won. I and won. 168 the, of them wanted me. And he got the privilege of dying once. And he wanted to. Yeah, thank you. Hello. 
Hello. I have a comment to make. I hope it's valuable. Um, it was about what you said about being the face of Jesus to that man. Um, I read a book this summer by Henry Nouwen. Henry Nouwen? He's a the great Wounded guy. Healer. Wounded Healer. Great book. And the story that struck me from that book was about a minister who was going to a man who was about to have surgery. And the minister seemed to fail in the, in the way that he sought to help the man who, about to go to surgery. Um, but Henry Nouwen's point was that one thing he could have done as a minister would have been to say that he would have waited for the man going to surgery, whether it was to wait for him on the other side of the surgery on, on earth, or some idea that in the afterlife. So I'm still working these thoughts out, but I think that what you did was to wait for that man. Yeah. And I, it's I a great image. I never thought of that, of waiting for someone. I will wait for you. I will be there for you. It's a way of being present. Yes, and, and for many people, not just for myself, but you have been a catalyst tonight. Um, and I, I hope that maybe I can wait for somebody in that sure. way. We all do that. We all have a chance to do that many, many ways. That's great. Thank you. Hello. Um, I have kind of a question slash comment. Um, it seems that there's a lot more national support right now for the moratorium idea yep. rather than the abolition. Um, and I stand somewhere in between those two lines. Um, and I wonder if it's not wise for um, the people who support this movement in this community uh, to focus their efforts on the abolition where there seems to be so much more of a possibility of achieving that immediate goal. I would just like to hear what you would have to say. You know what? Uh, the way the universe works is things are in a quantum. Things are in a flow. What's good about the moratorium, I always make clear, moratorium on the way to abolition. Uh, to belong to the European Union, the countries, including Russia. Uh, abol uh, moratorium on the death penalty with a view toward abolition. Where we have new ground for a moratorium. First step, stop the killing, like a ceasefire in a war. People killing each other. First you stop the killing, that's the ceasefire, but then you know you have to work for the permanent solution, which has to do with justice, which alone will promote peace, any conflict that goes on in the world. So moratorium, I'm sitting with the governor of New Mexico, who is looking me dead in the eye, saying, sister, you got to understand, I'm an eye for an eye man. And I'm thinking, this is not going to go well, <laughs> this governor. And then he says to me, but look, we've had five innocent people come off a of death row here in New Mexico, and look at all these people in the death rows. We can't make it work. We got the theory of what we want to do. We have the outrage over their crimes, but we can't make it work. And it's morally repugnant to me to put my name on something where I'm going to be executing innocent people, so I will call for a moratorium. People always have to be given a graceful way to take steps toward life. Moratorium is graceful. If we stop the death penalty in this country and study it, even Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor out loud to a group of women lawyers in Minnesota said, I got questions about the death penalty. She has passed through those death penalty decisions like all the other Supreme Court justices. But she said with all those innocent people coming off a of death row, the numbers are the, statistic, the probability is we've executed already an innocent person. And so people start to have questions. And when they have questions and doubts, first you stop the killing, and then we can work. We can have a better atmosphere then to work for abolition. The truth is we're never going to be able to fix the death penalty. There's no fixing it because the DAs have to have the discretionary power to go for it or not. Some go for it, some don't, side by side. The victim makes a difference. The poverty of the person, all those things make a difference. We got no way of fixing it. If we can stop it, have a moratorium on it, study it, the more we study, the more we reflect, the more we see how intractable the problems are. And it gives even conservative Republicans, pe people who campaign for the death penalty, a graceful way to say, wait, I don't want to execute innocent people. George will. Governor George Ryan 
who said I campaigned on the death penalty when I ran for governor. But I'm not about to execute innocent people. You give people a chance to be decent. And I think that's why the moratorium is the next step for us, and then we can take the next one after that. That's a real good question, and I'm glad you asked it. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to add a comment about um, the events of this week and stuff, because I'm personally like completely astounded and floored by the fact that a group of people could have you know, made such intricate planning to carry off any kind of act as what you know, these people, whoever they are, did. And I don't know, I personally feel that whoever, I mean, I don't believe in the death penalty, I don't believe in killing people, but I do believe that we need to be assertive and find out who people are. Sure. Sequester them just to make sure that they don't sure. do it again, because from what... Find them and imprison them. Can we do that? What, I think that's what we need to do. And I mean, because, like, if we, if we kill them, that's probably only, you know, they're, I mean, these people obviously believe in martyrdom. That's right. And they're going to, that's going to make them feel vindicated. And But that's if right. we imprison them, that's going to be a bad, as be a much more assertive way. And right. I think that that happens many of the, um, I mean, obviously, many of the people who are on death row are, like, you know, decent people. They're innocent. I mean, you know, and they, you know, they're good people. But there are some people who are really bad and horrible and, like, messed up and have no remorse. But those people want to die. So by killing them, you're basically doing exactly what they want you to do. And they're coming, becoming martyrs, which, yeah. and I, so I think that that's an important reason to go against the death penalty in all situations, even ones as horrible as what's happened on Tuesday. Yeah. You know, Amnesty International did do a study where they executed terrorists and found that every time they executed a terrorist, it spawned other acts of terrorism because it's an extreme mentality and you're bringing out the martyrdom thing. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that because if people, if, yeah, if, we, if we find, you know, Osama bin Laden and he's done this and we execute him, there are going to be other people who are going to then want to revenge, avenge his death. And there's going to, I mean, there's, it's going to just become a vicious circle. So I think How about if we raise the moral level of our society to say, yes, of course, we have to protect ourselves against these dangerous people, but we are not going to imitate them. I we will that. not reduce ourselves to imitating them. How about that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Let's see, we got... Uh, if, if you could make your comment short, I hate to rush you, but we got about seven people there, and I do want to get to the books to sign up for people. So, Well, you mentioned context, and that's something that I definitely believe in, and I think that so many people that commit egregious crimes against humans and humanity, like what was just done, do it out of some sad, delusional, misled reality that they think they're doing some sort of goodness. Mm -hmm. So often religion is a divisive factor, and I'm a person that doesn't have religion, but I believe that I have spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe, I mean, from your presence, you're very comforting and warm, and you know, you brought me to tears many times. And I just want to know, as a member of an organized religion, how would you answer that? And how, how do you... How would I answer what? The evil that's done by so many religions, and, and the divisiveness of it all. Look, religious people, they need graceful ways out of things, too. In the Catholic Church, there has been a real development and debate and growth on the death penalty, so that now you got the Pope calling out against the death penalty. That was a journey in that, coming to that. But we have to believe all human beings are at least as decent as we are, and people, if given a chance, can grow and develop. And that includes religious people. Sometimes it's just that people have blinders on, you know, or my image is that people's experience is real limited. And like, you know, you ever seen, did your little brother get a little train? And they had one little track around the Christmas trees, one little track. And the train just goes around that one little track. And when you come to a place like Barnard, there's no way you're going around one little track. You have all these experiences. But people, they need to be given a chance. And, and compassion, compassion for everybody, even people with religion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in the past few days, I've just been seemed somewhat overwhelmed by, you know, all of the violent rhetoric that's been going around and these calls for revenge or for war or, and I'm wondering what do you think people who are activists for peace and for an end to violence, whether it's anti-war, anti-death penalty, how can we respond to such an overwhelming, uh, bloodthirsty nature and? Sort of the okay, let's start us. thinking of your hand on a rope in one place yeah. or thinking of one act. What's one that, that occurs to you? Maybe it's not the one you're going to do, but what's one thing that occurs to you that you could do? Well, actually, in um, my, one of my classes today, 
my professor said, everybody, just write to your Congress people okay. and write. And okay, so that's great. a friend and I are thinking of organizing petitions, and we're actually drafting a letter tonight. So. Absolutely. And to get a, a handwritten letter from a student who's thinking and says, please don't do this, they need those letters from us. That seems like such a tiny act, a little bitty pebble dropped in a great big ocean, but do it. Do it, and then it brings you to the next level of what it is you need to do. Thank you. Good for you. Thanks. Um, I just had a question. I'm strongly against the death penalty, but I was wondering if any of the people you've talked to, either politicians or victims' families, have been able to explain to you, if they're so outraged by one murder and one killing, how they're okay with another one after that. Well, you have to understand that victims get put under pressure too. When you have a death penalty in a society and you have the district attorney coming to see you and the DA is saying to you, now often this is not for people of color, okay? But they come to you and they say, your daughter's been killed, so we are going to seek the ultimate punishment as a way of showing respect for your daughter. If we seek a lesser punishment, it looks like we didn't respect her life. And you got to be pretty morally developed and you have dealt with your own grief and your own rage to say to that DA, no, we don't want you seeking the death. Now, some of them do that from the beginning, square one. They haven't sorted it all out, but they're not about to get involved in this whole death thing and have the death of another human being. Can, you can understand, though, in their vulnerability and their pain and their grief, and the DA says that, and they say, right on, We'll be right there. Thank you for doing this for our daughter. And they identify it as respect for their loved one. And it's a pressure on them. And then how do they get out of it? I knew a family in Louisiana. They got on publicly on the press, everything, said they're for the death penalty. And then they couldn't get out. They couldn't get out from under it after it because it looked like they were betraying their loved one. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you for being here. I just wanted to say that I think what you're doing is really important, especially when the leader of our country refers to people, innocent people in another country who have nothing to do with what happened on Tuesday as collateral damage and how he's not going to have any respect for their lives, even though they had nothing to do with this. They're the ones being oppressed by the government that may or Wait, may not. Excuse have. me, but I missed that. What was that statement? Um, who Bush, said it? Bush called the was people. Was it Bush or Timothy McVeigh who said collateral damage? No, Bush. No. <laughs> Bush said the other day on a new, well at least they were saying that he, that the United States usually cares about the lives of innocent civilians when they're in war and that Bush, because of what happened on Tuesday, would no longer care about collateral damage, meaning wow. the lives of innocent civilians. So I think what you're doing is really important, especially All right. since and that attitude is really and prevailing. And you too, you get in there, hope you'll sign a petition, be part of this. Thank you. What an alive group. First, I'd like to thank you for your gracious words tonight. And second of all, I'd like to raise the issue of racial prejudice. Yeah. And not only the death penalty, but especially this week, um, any person with dark hair, dark skin, especially males, are targeted so yes. evilly yes. by people. I've heard countless stories and accounts across the country. A man got on a train from, I believe it was Boston to Washington, D.C., who was a Sikh with a beard and a turban, oh. taken off and arrested, put in jail, for no reason but his his appearance. Wow. Kids on that train was calling him, you know, evil, kill him, kill him. Wow. He had no role. And one thing about the Sikh religion is that people were, who are baptized wear a kirpan, which is a small sword for a, a, a symbol of strength and defense as a soldier to fight when you're, you know, in danger. And, you know, because of that as well, he was, you know, put as a, it was shown as, if, you know, as if he's a more evil individual for having this. But it's ignorance that, that causes this. It's not because of religion that people do these acts. And even yesterday, I walked a Sikh friend of mine who's male from 14th Street to 42nd Street to give blood at Port Authority. And I can't tell you how many stares we received and how many people were just, you know, the, the wow. type of looks you've gotten. And just anybody, if you're a Jew and you look dark, and pe I've heard stories of people being told, you know, what the fuck are you looking at? Because for no reason, standing right. in the subway, you know, wow. it's, and it's everywhere, you know. It's like it's, it's prejudice, and people are afraid, and yeah. so they're paranoid, mm -hmm. and so they got it color coded, yeah. and they see the color. And, and the fear is understandable, but you know, it, yeah. ignorance is just going to perpetuate it more. Yeah. And I think it's so important that we raise awareness about this right now. And yes, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you.
Sister Helen, first of all, I'll be succinct. I know it's getting late. Um, it's a great honor to just be in your presence and have a chance to meet you afterwards you. personally. Uh, I have, and my companion here, have been always against the death penalty. I have some dilemmas with war situations. When a person is a prisoner and taken, and there are other choices to be made with reference to justice as well as rehabilitation, I am categorically against the death penalty categorically in all stages, even Adolf Eichmann. I'm Jewish, but that, I'm Jewish, I'm human, I'm black, I'm yellow, I'm, you know, I'm a human being. And even then, I remember Martin Buber, I think, was one of the voices against that mm -hmm. in, in Israel, and he, he was like a prophet uh, at that point. So that's how strongly I feel. Killing Adolf Eichmann does not solve the Holocaust. So I would rather have had him in life in prison. So that's how categorical I am. And when I was asked to serve on grand jury once on a homicide case, the first thing I did is walk over, I mean I was selected, to the judge and say, if it's going to be a capital case, I cannot serve. I simply cannot as a matter of my deepest principle. And I was assured at that one it wasn't, though I'd rather not serve on any homicide cases if I have the choice. Here is my dilemma. With the terrorist thing now, I think of what Gandhi, I think, said. And when I think of Jesus, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Those um, my heroes too. Abraham Heschel, prophets, mm -hmm. prophets of our yeah. time yeah. and of times before, Gandhi, I think, felt that any kind of violence, even Hitler's violence, must be dealt with in a pass totally pacifist way Dr. King, I remember, on the eve, and I was standing out in the park, of the 1967 Mideast War, where they were all, all the countries were ready to crush Israel. Um, he couldn't be there, but he sent a telegram saying, Israel has the right, as any nation, as any person, as any people, to defend itself. I can tell you that it, war is always tragedy. The death of anyone, no matter for what reason, is always tragedy, and as you would say, the loss of a universe, even of perpetrator. But I can't say I myself, and I'm, I'm saying this in an open-ended way because I want to be affected by you and by this too. I can't say that in war, I would be a pacifist. I mean, I would. I would join medical corps, that I can say, or something like that if I had to be called up, not to kill. But there are times where I think it is horrible, it's tragic, but it's justified. I never feel it's justified when a person is caught, that you calculatedly, by the state and by all the laws of the land, put someone to death. Never. I'm against that totally, as you have expressed. The dilemma with the terrorists situation and how we respond to people who inflict so much. I'm not right. saying if they're caught. If they're caught, no. No mm -hmm. capital punishment. But some preemptive things that may prevent a much greater loss, I have a dilemma about here. All right, what if we and put all of our that. energies, what if we put all of our mm -hmm. energies, instead of invading Afghanistan, I mean all these options yes. are being considered, nuking Afghanistan and the Taliban, uh, what if we put the energies and intelligence into finding them and arresting them, bringing them before The Hague for trial, and then imprisonment? Incapacitate them. I'm that, we do have a right to self-defense against people who are very, very violent. Right. It's not mm -hmm. like passivism means being passive, No. or we do nothing. Sure, we can do something. Let's be assertive. Let's use all the intelligence of all the global, all the nations, to come together to do this. I would much prefer that, and I certainly endorse that. Yeah. In a war situation, if someone's aiming a rifle at you and you're aiming a rifle, do you have a right, or in a robbery, if, you know, Okay, well, we that's don't have another to deal dilemma. with that situation okay. right now, so I let's try you. to deal with this one and see what self-defense, legitimate self-defense for society might be against people who have done such an well, act as I this. share that. Yeah, great. Thank, Thank you. you so much for what you share. All right, sir, you're the last. Would you try to be profound? <laughs> <laughs> Don't feel under any pressure. Thank you. First, I just wanted to thank you for coming tonight. I was against the death penalty before you came in. I signed the petition as I walked in. Oh, great. Unfortunately, I haven't read your book yet. I will as soon as possible. Salvation may soon be yours. But I did... 
And did you see the film? I still have That's it. That's two for two. <laughs> But, but you I signed did. a petition when you came in. You, yes, you're I good. did, and you're I good. signed one last week, a state one. But I did want to let everyone know, in addition, the book that helped me uh, take my stand was, it's a rather old book, I think it's from the 40s, uh, Native Son by Richard Wright. Oh, man, that's a that, great book. That it, if Native anyone, Son by Richard Wright. If anyone hadn't read it, it's about um, a crime that was basically accidental by someone who had very little control, and it's fiction, but of what happened after, and it is just incredible. It's a great book, isn't it? And Thank you. Sure That's you a good that. note to end on. Thank you. Anybody wants a book, I'll be glad to sign it for you. Thank you. I just want to